Now, uh, actually, what I was, uh, what I intended to discuss is uh, where we stand now and where things are heading. So we have many lectures of people who are discussing uh, the progress in uh, analysis of the components of ca cannabis. There are others who discuss the biology and uh, knowledge that is being developed in uh, research on cancer. Um, you can see if you analyze the number of uh, ex research uh, projects that are go uh, being undertaken nowadays that there is a great increase in the number of studies. Some of them are not necessarily uh, concerned with the use of cannabis. This is just an interjection until our technology uh, breaks through. But um, there are even studies on using THC to treat cannab can cannabinoid addiction. Okay, so people are using cannabis and they are studying to see if you can treat them with THC to help them come off their addiction to cannabis. This is not a joke. You go into the clinicaltrials.gov and you will see such experiments being carried out nowadays. Um, in any case, so there are a lot of evolutions. What I am trying to describe to a certain extent in this presentation is the evolution of our approach to cannabis. Um, and uh, for that matter, uh, we want to see if we are becoming more open-minded, more rational, less emotional about this topic. Because this is key to uh, making progress. One of the great obstacles nowadays to making advances in clinical reality with cannabis as it is available today, both for clinical practice and for clinical research, is the stance of the doctors and their medical organizations. Typically, they are opposed, they are limiting the use of cannabis, and they are holding back both on the clinical research of uh, cannabis and cannabinoid-derived preparations. And it is my interpretation that some of this resistance is not rational uh, at, its, at its core, even though the doctors claim to be acting in a rational sphere uh, under the blessing of the uh, myth of modern science, so to speak. But actually, um, if a patient comes to a doctor and tells them, look, doctor, I have received uh, a certain preparation, I have smoked a joint that my neighbor who was ill is getting legally and he saw me suffering, he gave me a joint to puff on. He said, take this, this will, will help you. And I took it and it helped me. And this patient comes to a standard doctor in Israel where they already have seen patients respond to cannabis. They often will end up with a response from the doctor, the rational uh, doctor talking in the name of medical medicine and science, um, he will say, there is no proof. There is no proof. What does that mean? That the patient who is presenting empirical evidence is not presenting acceptable proof in the eyes of the doctor. It is not written down in a peer-reviewed re uh, article. So the standard of knowledge is a peer-reviewed peer uh, article and not what that article is based on because the articles are written ultimately based on data taken from the real world. So it's a kind of detour. Let's see how we progress now with this uh, presentation. Page down. <laughs> So, I said I'll start with some general uh, comments, and I can't, 
assume that what I have said so far constitutes um, uh, and, uh, some kind of form of general comments. Um, this is a general de depiction of what we are discussing and dealing with. I think it unfortunately does reflect quite a lot of what is happening. Yeah, dots or lines? You see, we didn't put any question marks. We're not that specific. And this sort of represents what I have uh, mentioned in favor of cannabis and opposed to cannabis. And although this is cr quite crude and not uh, supported by uh, statistical analysis of uh, questionnaires distributed as sociologists would like to see, this does represent a crude impression, uh, I believe, not only of my own. Okay, so where uh, can we uh, look for some progress other than all these questionnaires and everything? It may be reflected in what is happening in regulation because the regulation does represent some kind, some form uh, of approach of the uh, governing bodies to uh, what we are attempting to promote promote not in the sense of to sell, but to bring progress. So, uh, in modern times, I'm not going back to history and the unfortunate lady, young lady who lay there with uh, cannabis in her uh, abdomen from several thousand years ago. I'll start with the single convention on narcotic drugs, which is uh, um, a, a certain uh, station in uh, what is happening with uh, cannabis in uh, modern times. So this is a convention that was uh, initially published in uh, 61 after a convention between leading nations under the auspices of the, the uh, international organization, the United Nations, and it has been amended by, uh, uh, in 1972 and I, I'm just going to point out some things. This really might be uh, in, in, uh, inaccurate, but you see that the, the concept of serious evil is associated with the use of cannab cannabis, uh, with narcotic drugs in general. So this is, evil is not a rational term, okay? These are uh, quotations from uh, the article itself, we all like to quote, but I don't know how many people have read through it. And you need to read it through it several times to get, uh, get uh, an idea of what they are talking about because it is like a legal document, you know. Every word has meaning. And of course, they go into definitions and they defi define also, among other things, what they mean uh, when they mention the word cannabis. So it is the flowering or fruiting uh, tops of cannabis. It can mean any plant uh, of the cannabis sativa, and the resin means separated resin, quite clear. <clears throat> and they talk about uh, in Article 28, where this is, uh, as we said, uh, uh, an official document. Um, if a party permits the cultivation of cannabis for production of cannabis or cannabis resin, it shall apply to the system of controls as provided in Article 23, respecting the control of opium poppy. So here we see that actually they applied the approach to poppy, to morphine, uh, to uh, cannabis as well. Pretty soon we'll have a look at, in a minute, we'll, in a second, we'll have a look at uh, Article 23. In addition, it is interesting to see that this convention shall not apply to the cultivation of cannabis plant exclusively for industrial purposes, fiber and seed, or horticultural purposes. Now, this is, I, it appears that many of our regulators are not aware of this item. They've skipped over it because they do not allow cultivation of plant, uh, cannabis plants for industrial uh, or horticultural purposes. 
That is a fact in Israel, definitely, and I believe, as far as I know, that this is true in other countries as well. So they go beyond, they go beyond themselves to implement this uh, um, convention. And then they say the parties shall adopt such measures as may be necessary to prevent the misuse of and illicit traffic in the leaves of cannabis plant. I don't know, I think there's a slide later on, but I'll uh, mention it here already. You see, uh, they uh, will adapt measures as may be necessary. Now, what is necessary? We go back to Article uh, 23. So, a party that permits, a party in this case is one of the states signed, uh, which has signed on this convention. And if it permits the cultivation of poppy for, for production, uh, I, instead of poppy, I should say cannabis in this state, because we, right, we're saying that the same should apply to cannabis. So if a party permits cultivation of cannabis for the production of cannabis, it shall establish, if it has not already, uh, already done so, and maintain one or more government agencies. So here we have some kind of form of regulation. We know that who is in charge of this? The state to carry out the functions required. Now, such, each such party, every state, Israel, United States, Slovenia, shall apply the following provisions to the cultivation of cannabis for the production of cannabis and cannabis. The agency will designate where it will be grown, right? The state <coughs> uh, will determine where it can be grown and where not. It will provide licenses to grow and only those who receive the licenses can grow it. This is in the convention. Each license shall specify the extent of land. So how much land can be allotted to grow these, uh, the cannabis? All the cultivators uh, shall be required to deliver, <coughs> to deliver their total crops of cannabis to the agency. The agency shall purchase and take physical possession of such crops as soon as possible, but no later than four months after the end of harvest. Now, the agency shall have, in respect to cannabis, the exclusive right to importing, exporting, wholesale trading, and maintaining stocks other than those held by manufacturers of cannabis, um, medicinal cannabis, or preparations of cannabis uh, for medical purposes. So uh, when we have medical, medical applications, it is somewhat excluded from uh, um, this uh, control of the agency, it, it is somewhat uh, modified. Parties, as I said, need not extend this exclusive right to medicinal cannabis. This is in the 1961 convention, which is so commonly co quoted by all kinds of authorities as something which gives them complete control, and they say, we, have no, we are very sorry, we want to help the people, but the, we are signed on this convention. So the convention does give them the freedom to, ex uh, to uh, provide the right uh, to uh, import, export, produce, maintain stocks, etc., to whoever they find uh, appropriate. And then, of course, uh, they say once again that the governmental functions referred to in the paragraph shall be discharged by a single government agency, if it is possible. Okay. Now, regarding the regulatory status of uh, cannabis. Cannabis, uh, there are many different uh, schemes of uh, scheduling 
drugs. So this is just one scheme. Usually when we are talking about the FDA and the Schedule 1 scheduling of cannabis, that is something else, okay? Their Schedule 1 is the most restrictive of all. Here, this is a somewhat different uh, format of scheduling. Cannabis is scheduled as Schedule 1 and Schedule 4, okay? So, the drugs in Schedule 4 shall also be included in Schedule 1. And, as noted, um, a party shall adopt any special measures of control. That is, the state will adopt any special measures of control at which its opinion, in, uh, which, which in its opinion are necessary. So, the party, each and every state, actually has the freedom to determine its policies, okay? They have the right, they have the opportunity to adopt any special measures according to their evaluation of the need to control in such a manner. A party shall, if in its opinion the prevailing conditions in its country render it the most appropriate means of protecting the public health and welfare prohibit this and prohibit that and uh, etc. Okay, and here once again I emphasize that. <clears throat> and in the end, uh, they uh, point out, and I've put it in a nice uh, square in the bottom, except for amounts which may be necessary for medical and scientific research only, including clinical trials therewith to be conducted under or subject to the direct supervision and control of the party. So, okay, you have a mechanism, but you can, they, they exclude that from the, from the right to prohibit it. So there is less of a prohibish, prohibition on providing cannabis. Definitely the kind of cannabis which uh, Sue Sisley has shown us yesterday to be provided by uh, the government, by the FDA in the United States. And the same applies for other countries, including in Israel. So, here we are stuck. This is uh, together with the uh, positions of the med of the doctors, of their organizations, social norms, etc., combined with the bureaucracy derived and uh, always pointing to uh, this con uh, convention um, where we run into a lot of trouble. Now, there is some progress over the years, the last sev several uh, years, the last decade or so, we have seen uh, a push a grassroots drive to bring uh, cannabis into the front line, trying to develop uh, research and clinical applications based on, on the plant and its derivatives. And this is reflected to an extent in a committee which was uh, appointed by the World Health Organization and actually encouraged to meet, requested to meet, and perform uh, some kind of review uh, uh, to reevaluate the status of cannabis and its uh, derivatives. <clears throat> this was uh, initiated or initially presented in uh, a meeting in uh, the summer just one year ago. This is the WHO Expert Committee on Drug uh, Dependence, the ECDD, which got quite a lot of publicity. So, uh, a couple of years earlier, the, uh, this committee uh, acknowledged increasing use of cannabis and its components uh, for medical purposes. So we see that things have changed since 61 and 1972. And the emergence of new cannabis-related pharmaceutical preparations for therapeutic use. So, something is changing. What do they have to say about CBD? This is according to the order of the chapters in the report. 
They discuss uh, some technical aspects and this and that, and then they come down to item 6.20, their recommendation. They say quite clearly, and this is the leading committee on drug dependence under the uh, authority of the World Health Organization, although all the, rep <coughs> all the uh, experts in the committee are not or, or explicitly pointing out that these are their personal views. It does not represent the official stance of the, uh, of the organization. In any case, they say, CBD is one of the natural occurring cannabinoids found in cannabis plants. There are no case reports of abuse until yesterday. <laughs> I guess so. But in any case, this is their stand on it. There are no case reports of abuse or dependence relating to the use of pure CBD. No public health problems have been associated with CBD use. It has been found to be generally well tolerated and to have a good safety profile. They mentioned some adverse effects, loss of appetite, diarrhea, and fatigue, possibly, and reversible. They do not know this. They do not go into details. Therapeutic re applications are being researched for a variety of clinical uses. We are quite aware of that. Uh, this is the fashion of CBD, which actually reflects the demonization of THC, OK? Demonization of THC, and of course, uh, the uh, relatively convenience of using CBD, because it is easier for uh, the industry to acquire and to develop as something that can be uh, put on the market. CBD is not specifically listed in the schedules of 1961, 1971, or later on in 1988, after another uh, review. However, if prepared as an extract or tincture, it is controlled under, uh, under Schedule 1 of the, the Single Conve Convention on Narcotic Drugs, which we mentioned uh, just a moment ago. There is no evidence. This is the summary of the review of this committee. There is no evidence that CBD as a substance is liable to similar abuse or leads to similar ill effects to, sub to substances controlled under 1961 or uh, 71 conventions such as cannabis or THC. What do they recommend? That preparations considered to be pure CBD should not be scheduled at all. Not Schedule 1, not Schedule 2, not 3, not 4. It is not perceived by them to uh, answer the criteria of a drug requiring uh, scheduling. So this is one form of uh, progress in terms of regulation. They, <clears throat> this committee does not determine the regulations in the specific countries, it, but its uh, recommendations still have value, they, have, they are visible, and they represent that they are promoted and published by a formal leading health-related uh, organization. And then they discuss uh, cannabis and cannabis resin. Um, they point out the differences. I am going to be short because we are all hungry. And they have questions because all these products are quite variable. So they say that it is possible that including cannabis and cannabis resin in Schedule 4 may not be consistent with the criteria for inclusion in Schedule 4. We're not going to go into those uh, criteria right now. Um, and uh, the, they note that the evidence represented to the committee did not indicate that the plant or the resin were liable to produce ill effects similar to those of other substances in Schedule 4 in the Convention. It is a significant point. They concluded that there is sufficient evidence to recommend a critical review of the cannabis plant and cannabis resin at a future ECDD meeting, and uh, they did so. But uh, I uh, chose to point out this uh, summary because I think it reflects some of the shift 
in the atmosphere, in the higher levels of, of the formal organizations who really are uh, formulating the regulation worldwide. The same goes for extracts and uh, tinctures. Um, they noted, among others, that the category of extract and tinctures of cannabis encompasses very diverse formulations with various ratios of cannabis components, in particular the THC. And therefore, to come up with an all-inclusive uh, uh, demonization of these tinctures and extracts uh, has to be considered. Now, what about THC? Okay, this is an interesting item in the review regarding Delta 9 THC, dronabinol. Okay, there are different uh, isomers of this uh, um, molecule. Dronabinol is the active one. Uh, as THC does not be, <clears throat> now THC does not appear to be abused. It has been around for many years, okay? A multi-method review revealed little evidence that its oral formulation was used for non-medical purposes. Before we were trying to distance the CBD from the THC and now we see that the THC itself is, well, not being abused. Phenomena such as doctor shopping or script chasing, looking to, um, acting out with all kinds of manipulations to gain access to, to THC are not common. So, uh, <clears throat> their impression is that THC does not appear to have caused a public health problem related to misuse, abuse, or dependence. See section 913. They re re point us out to the item we are, have just uh, noted above. And the recommendation is that uh, THC and its isomers are listed in Schedule 2. That is how it is, because they isolated the dronabinol and promoted it as a drug for primarily uh, nausea and vomiting related to chemotherapy. And it was actually uh, allotted the status of a pharmaceutical. So. <clears throat> In previous uh, reviews, THC, especially dronabinol, the most potent psychotropic uh, component of cannabis, has been considered in a synthetic form as a pharmaceutical preparation. However, they also recognize that THC, in particular, in its active naturally occurring stereoisomer, also refers to the main psychoactive component of cannabis, as we have just noted. So on the one hand, we have a pharma synthetic pharmaceutical uh, preparation, which is uh, Schedule II. And now they say, but still, it's in cannabis, and it is psychotropic, so uh, it produces the similar ill effect, dependence and abuse potential to canna cannabis. So, uh, what I wanted to point out here is that this respectable uh, committee had observed what we all are very well aware of, that there is this paradox. The most potent psychotropic element in cannabis was scheduled relatively benign and de determined to be a pharmaceutical preparation. When it is diluted, in the plant, it is considered for whatever reason, possibly historical reasons and others, it can be analyzed else, elsewhere and uh, at some other opportunity, it is determined to be uh, um, something which is not acceptable, which is a drug which the state can uh, deal with more severely. So that is uh, some comments regarding the, sh the shift in the atmosphere in the regulation which gives us some f sense of optimism, even though we know that after that, the ICNB, the, the uh, Committee on Narcotic Drugs, uh, under the auspices of the UN, retaliated and said uh, they did not accept the conclusions of this uh, committee of the World Health Organization, 
but still it is a step forward because there is some uh, discourse being carried out to this effect. Now, uh, regarding trends, um, I don't know how much time I have now. Uh, regarding trends, of course, one of the obvious trends is uh, the rise of the uh, the um, the green uh, green gold boom. Maybe we could say the the market. Uh, the, uh, of cannabis, medical cannabis, let us call it for this uh, say, uh, purpose, is growing immensely and is predicted to grow even more and more to be worth 43 billion in 2023 and then to 63 billion dollars and grow more and more. When you, when you are discussing uh, an economic phenomenon on this scale, then obviously many other business-related considerations come into, consider, uh, come into play and all kinds of actors uh, other than uh, dedicated physicians and so on and activists and people who are ill and in need of the cannabis as they know it from their own personal experience, uh, all these other actors come into play and control uh, the majority of the market and uh, access to cannabis. So there's a certain tension between legalization on one hand, sort of freeing access to cannabis, and medicalization, whereby uh, the concept of medicalization is sort of uh, means to impose the more strict, rigid, regulatory concept of what medicine is all about on this field of activity. So you cannot just take the cannabis, just like I cannot just walk down the road and enjoy myself, I have to count my steps and my calories to know that I'm doing the right thing. Here, I cannot take <coughs> cannabis just freely grown in my garden. I have to have it analyzed and packaged and provided with a prescription. So there is a trend in the direction of medical conserv <coughs> conservatism, uh, definitely um, among uh, the professionals at this time, even though possibly with the change of generations, this might change. For now, things are tending more and more in the direction of medical conservatism. <coughs> this is reflected among others in these, this CBD fad, which I have mentioned before. There is this odd notion of finding the golden bu bullet, you know. They talk about, this is, the planet, uh, this is the plant for this disease, and then, you know, I have something which I can sell for, for one billion, and I will, uh, you know, I, it will be a great economic and business success for me and my company. And I apologize at this point, mentioning companies and all, all that, I did not uh, mention the disclosure in the, be in the beginning because although I am a physician uh, and I have been acting as a physician over the last, oh, well, in the context of using cannabis, I have been using cannabis as a, in palliative care over the last decade, let's say, and I've seen circa 5,000 patients in that context, but now in context, in relation to all these changes and everything, I, my position is shifting and I am associated and I'm a consultant of one of these companies which I'm talking so critically about myself at this point. Um, so I, I can explain that paradox perhaps to myself, uh, how we are in the same bed. Um, I think there is place, there is room for everything, there is room for science, but we have to be respective, we have to have a respect for all that is happening and there is room for everything in this uh, big world. It does not necessarily contradict. Um, so in any case, there is this tendency to match chemovars and the, the plant is so complex and the criteria of the medical uh, science, so to speak, are so rigid that there is no way that in a foreseeable future, even with the application of most modern technologies, which will indeed speed up this process, and I'm spe uh, me uh, 
means specifically the artificial intelligence technologies which will enable us to process all the complex data much more effectively. Even with that, uh, to come up with one plant for one disease will be, I don't know, it's not going to happen within the foreseeable future. Um, this relates, for example, to the question that was uh, presented uh, before regarding the use of cannabis for cancer. How much would you recommend? How would you dose it? Now, let alone all, all, you know, all the variability in the preparations. Let's say we have a fixed prepar uh, preparation extract from a, uh, from a plant, which is identical each and every time, 100%. <clears throat> there are pharmacokinetics. How much of that cannabis will be absorbed into the body? We don't know. It changes from one person to the other. We know that if people inhale cannabis, the effect of two grams in one person may be the effect of 10 grams in another. So how can we tell the patients, this is the protocol, you take 10 grams. It's going to be too much for one of them and not enough for another. So we have to adapt, we have to titrate it, we have to be pragmatic. Because we, <clears throat> clinical medicine is in the real world, it is not in regulations. We do not know the results up front. We will be able to know up front if we are acting according to a certain regulation, because it is fixed in time. But we will not know what effect we have, we have to provide the treatment and observe, follow, and then adapt the treatment. And it is obviously does not stop just with absorption. Maybe one patient absorbs this more than the other molecule, and then it travels, and maybe travels in one more to the lung and less to the liver, and another more to the liver and less to the lung. And then there are uh, variations in how it is metabolized. So one metabolizes these components faster, the other one metabolizes it breaks it down in a slower manner. And then the interaction with the target cells. Maybe there are variations. So in one case, there is one effect. In another case, there's another effect. So there are so many variables. It is hard to bring down, cut and dry into a formula and say, this is what is useful for you. What we can do as clinicians is make certain rules so that we approach the treatment rationally, okay? We acknowledge our role as clinicians and establish good communication from the patients because many of the oncological patients <clears throat> are using all kinds of preparations that the doctors do not know because of a breach in communication. There's problem with trust. The patients do not know how the doctors will respond to their using this or the other uh, drug. I'm not talking about cannabis. I'm talking about taking vitamin C. I'm talking about avoiding sugars. And some of the doctors say, wait, well, you know, they'll feel uncomfortable. They'll say, listen to me, I'm the doctor, I will tell you. And the moment the patient comes with something from another source of knowledge, he will, the doctor will feel that his authority is being undermined. <clears throat> um, so th that is one rule. Another rule, for example, is to tell the patients to set up red flags, to say, okay, I'm trying this treatment, but will I go on trying it without end? Maybe if I see that my disease com continues to progress, at some point I will say, okay, if this is that big, if I cannot go and continue with my work, I will try something else because this is not working. Maybe I'll try change the treatment, maybe I'll change the schedule, maybe I'll change my expectations. But red flags, this is how a clinician in the field can work. Um, when you start a new intervention, you need a certain signpost. You say, I am starting this treatment in a certain situation. I am having 10 seizures every day regularly. I am having two seizures every day regularly. This is my problem. And then 
all other treatments are held steady, I come with a new intervention and I see if there is a change, then I say, possibly, this change is because of what I used. Maybe it is because of sunspots and I'm not being sarcastic. Because many things in our environment change. The season changes, our nutrition changes, all kinds of things. Time changes. Okay, our disease evolves. But still, we need some kind of signposts we can hold on to. And then when we have marked what the situation is, we can interpret somewhat rationally what our response to the treatment is. So this has to do, you know, uh, with... Uh, I, I have diverged into this uh, sermon <laughs> because uh, I wanted to contradict the notion of the magical uh, formula for this and this di disease. Now, there are crude notions. We will all know that most likely this will be more effective than that. And with experience, we'll know a bit better, perhaps. But still, um, what I said before, I think, is valid in its own right. And possibly, if we get, can stabilize our preparations, and as research still does provide us with more insights, we will be narrow, able to narrow down the options and arrive at the desired resp uh, responses faster more efficiently and with uh, less side effects. Um, now, I was talking about medical uh, conservatism, and again, I don't know where I am as far as the time is concerned. I can't hear your bellies gurgling, so... <laughs> um, this is a representation of what I mean when I talk about medical uh, conservatism. <clears throat> There's something known as uh, evidence-based medicine, and there are certain uh, um, centers concerned with deriving uh, knowledge which is acceptable to the medical community. One of the more conservative uh, systems is the Cochrane uh, Reviews. Okay, so they have very strict criteria. What is acceptable for review and what is considered negligible. So, um, for example, case reports are rejected. Case reports are not accepted um, in many of these reviews. So, here there's a review, relatively modern review from 2006, concerning um, anti-emetic anti -emetic medication for prevention and treatment of uh, nausea and vomiting uh, with chemotherapy uh, in children. And the conclusion, and they always have brief summaries also for the lay public, their conclusion is quite clear. They say, cannabinoids are probably effective but produce frequent side effects. So I said, well, okay, well, what side effects are they talking about? So I went and I looked into the, the articles they are quoting. So these are the data quoted in 2016. And they do a systematic review. They review thousands of things about, by, by technique and put them in tab, uh, tabulate the results, etc., etc. So one of the articles was published in 1979. Eckert et al. Amelioration of cancer chemotherapy induced uh, nausea and vomiting. For short, we call it CINV <coughs> by THC. And they say, well, THC was found to be significantly better anti nausea and anti vomiting agent. At that time, they did not have the modern anti nausea and vomiting agents. You have to keep that in mind, but still, this is valid. Because he's quoting it now. But not all patients obtained relief of nausea and vomiting with THC. In some patients, THC enhanced appetite during a course of chemotherapy. That's nice. In two patients out of, uh, it's not a gigantic uh, study, but there were more than 10 or 20 patients, there were 49 patients if I'm not mistaken. In two patients, a high associated with THC administration was reported. Well, that is a good reason to claim that, you know, we have to think about cannabis to treat CINV and quote that in 
the Cochrane review, systematic review. What about the second quotation? This is from 1987. On completion of the trial, 66% of, of the children stated that they preferred Nabilone, which is a synthetic uh, analog of uh, cannabinoids. 17% preferred another drug, seven, uh, and another 17 had no preference. So, um, where, if the patients themselves were getting the treatment and more than half of them preferred to have it, would, would, there be, would there be grounds to say that, well, maybe it is useful, but on the other hand, there are so many terrible side effects? More than half of them uh, wanted to continue with that treatment. And then with Nabilone, again, 18 of 23 consecutive eligible children completed the trial. Using the Nabilone, they experienced significantly fewer vomiting episodes and less nausea, and two-thirds ex two expressed a preference for the drug. Most common side effects of treatment with Nabilone were somnolence and dizziness, with one patient being disturbed by hallucinations. And actually, they adapted well to this, uh, to this uh, drug, and these side effects are reversible. So once again, this these three articles were the articles selected in a Cochrane systematic review in 2016 to claim that, well, on the one hand, possibly it helps, but on the other hand, there are many side effects. So that is what I mean when I talk about uh, uh, medical conservatism. Um, okay, the rest, there are other trends uh, that are coming to the fore uh, in, in current, uh, policies and approaches to using uh, cannabis. I think time is up, so uh, thank you so far for listening.